Hey everybody, Jack Sparrow here. Just dropped by in the neighborhood looking for the Black Pearl and Russ asked me to do this week's research review. Gotta do something to liven up some of this boring research. Yes, that's a nice little sound box of pirate talk. Don't you love it? Okay, this week we're going to talk about five research articles on ADHD. And the rest are contained in the thumbnail sketch that goes with this particular video. So let's get started. Jack needs his glasses on to do this. So there we go. And let's have a look. The first article we're going to take a look at is an effort to review research on the risk of neurodegenerative diseases and dementia in adults with ADHD. This is the first review on this topic I've seen. Uh, which is, I think, very interesting. There have been some individual papers earlier that were published that did suggest that there was some increased risk in later life for disorders of the basal ganglia, the cerebellum, uh, and even the frontal lobes in adults with ADHD as they aged. One of the papers even suggested that exposure to stimulant medication might well also further increase the risk for these neurodegenerative disorders. Uh, however, that paper qualified that finding by saying that there was a confounding factor and that more severe cases were likely to have been treated with medication and more medication, and therefore the outcome was not necessarily related to taking stimulants, but instead had to do with the individual's severity of ADHD predicting severity of neurodegenerative problems. So, so there's been this sort of finding back in the research over the last 10 years that there might be some issue here for ADHD. Well, this is a first review, uh, and they point out that uh, although they did find a number of studies uh, that they were able to take a look at, eventually seven met their criteria for the review. Uh, and in those studies, they had trouble comparing across studies because the way risk was measured was so different across them that they couldn't combine them to do a formal meta-analysis. But the authors did conclude that the current literature on the risk of neurodegenerative disease is quite limited. So we can say very little about it other than that among the studies that they were able to find, there was some small link between ADHD in adulthood and the subsequent development of dementia. However, the magnitude of the effect in ADHD was considered to be rather small, and the range of methodology in the studies uh, was quite variable. So overall, just calling for more research on this possibility and on an explanation as to why there might be this increased risk. One possibility is that keep in mind that the prefrontal cortex and also the motor cortex and the basal ganglia and the cerebellum, among others, are the areas of the brain that are implicated repeatedly as the basis for ADHD and they're maldeveloped and their functional connectivity is variable and rather poor. So it would make sense that as natural aging takes place, there would be this risk that these areas of the brain would deteriorate further. And given that they don't have a lot of normal neural reserve to, say, tolerate the aging process, we would start to see uh, a worsening, a further impact of aging in these regions, giving rise to neurodegenerative and dementia-like findings. So just a lot more research to be done at this point, uh, but an interesting review in the frontiers in psychiatry uh, this month. So I uh, hope you found that informative. Pieces of eight. Pieces of eight. Indeed, pieces of eight is right. So our next study is going to be on the efficacy of physical exercise interventions, uh, specifically for ADHD. Uh, and here is yet another review. We've talked about a few reviews earlier. This is another one. This, again, is an attempt to conduct a review and meta-analysis of papers published up until uh, earlier, or excuse me, late in uh, 2022. Uh, and Eventually, out of the 181 articles they identified, they found that there were 
10 reviews and 12 individual articles that met their inclusion criteria, that had sufficiently rigorous methodology in order to do analyses and draw conclusions. Once again, as with earlier reviews, we're seeing that the evidence does show some significant effect of physical exercise on improving attention, inhibition, and cognitive flexibility. However, they point out that the evidence for the effectiveness of exercise on emotion regulation, on social functioning, and on working memory was quite weak uh, and not significant. So, uh, and the same was true for hyperactivity as well as general behavioral functioning. So pointing out that there are some selective effects of exercise on ADHD, but not a ubiquitous one, not necessarily a very strong one, but something worth exploring further. And certainly exercise is something that can be recommended to our patients in order to help them cope better with their ADHD. Ahoy, Indeed, Ahoy is right. Let's move on to our next review, which is a meta-analysis of ADHD in children and the quality of their friendships. This review was published recently in PLUS ONE. Uh, and it's a very good review, actually. There's a lot of papers out there on social functioning in ADHD children. Uh, and this study happened to find a number of papers that included over 1,500 participants with ADHD compared to nearly 1,200 of typically developing uh, children. And they found that uh, in 19 of the 24 studies that they identified, they were able to make these kinds of comparisons with control groups. Overall, the paper finds that the friendship quality for ADHD children was quite poor, uh, as was the number of friends that these individuals had, close friends specifically, uh, and that there were poorer quality friendship interactions as well. Uh, nothing surprising, we have seen these findings going back to the 1970s in which ADHD children have substantial problems with their social functioning with other children. Some papers indicating that many children were utterly friendless by the end of second grade uh, and uh, even more if they had oppositional defiant disorder. So uh, just yet another paper, in this case, a th rather thorough review documenting this risk for social problems with ADHD. Now, I should point out that people will rush to say, well, then that's why we should be doing social skills training for ADHD children. Please don't. Research shows that most uh, packaged typical programs for social skills training like uh, skill streaming and others do not work to improve the social interactions of ADHD children. They weren't designed for ADHD. They're not based on a good theoretical understanding of ADHD. They're not based on the evidence of what is going wrong in these social interactions on ADHD. You're just throwing a canned intervention at these kids. And the evidence shows not only that it does not work, but more importantly, about 25% of ADHD children put in social skills groups get worse. It's a side effect of social skills training. It's called deviancy training. It's when more aggressive children interact with less aggressive ADHD children, and those interactions make everybody more aggressive. So this is a direct effect of grouping children together who have varying degrees of aggressive behavior, and as a result, you get these spillover effects. And this has been found in several studies, so it's not just a unique finding. It is a side effect of social skills training. So what that means is we don't want to be combining children together based on uh, or uh, on ADHD but not considering their level of aggression because you could make some of the members of that group worse by what you're trying to do. But regardless, the evidence shows that the typical programs don't work. Now, that said, Omori Mikami at the University of British Columbia took the executive functioning theory of mine went in and looked at the evidence from these studies of social interactions and set about creating a new approach to social skills training called Parent Friendship Coaching. It's actually out now in a book, in a clinical manual. She then proceeded to spend years of studying the effectiveness of this intervention in helping ADHD children with their friendships. Uh, and she did find significant improvement in the children who participated in these groups. So she has the only intervention 
designed expressly for ADHD that has found improvement from participation in the program. And unique to her intervention, as I said, is that it is using executive functioning theory <clears throat> in order to help guide the development of this program. So it's done by parents. It's done at home. It uses the natural flow of interactions. Uh, it focuses more on performance, less on skill development, though it does some skill training. Uh, and so it's much more, I think, suitable <clears throat> to ADHD children. So, uh, you know, congratulations to Dr. Mikami for coming up with that program and testing it. Yeah, very good article. Thank you, Parrot. Appreciate that. Hi, yes, Scallywags. Let's move on to our next review. Um, or excuse me, this is an original study. It's by my friends George Dupal uh, and Lisa Wyant. And this one was published uh, in the Archives of Sexual Behavior. And it is a study of risky sexual behavior, as you see here, in college students with and without ADHD. So they took college students assessed them upon entry into their freshman year, followed them throughout their college education, repeatedly examined them for kinds of risky sexual behavior as well as comorbid anxiety, comorbid depression, level of ADHD, uh, and so on, as well as their use of stimulant medication <clears throat> in order to manage their ADHD. So uh, a very good paper, and what they found, as you can see here, is that first year college students with ADHD reported significantly higher rates of risky sexual behavior. This is not uncommon. We found this in our Milwaukee longitudinal study. Kate Flory found it in her follow-up study of youth in the Pittsburgh longitudinal study, and it has subsequently been found by others. People with ADHD, as they grow up and become sexually active, start having intercourse earlier than others have more unprotected sex, don't use contraception as much, have shorter relationships and change sexual partners more often, and as a result of those behaviors are more likely to experience a sexually transmitted disease as well as a teenage or young adult pregnancy. So that has been found in several earlier studies. This study finds the same thing in college students with ADHD. They did find that the students with ADHD that were taking medication had significant decreases over time in risky sexual behavior. So medication helps reduce this risk. On the other hand, they did find that among those with ADHD, anxiety <clears throat> at time one was related to an increase in risky sexual behavior over time, while depression was more predictive of a decrease in risky sexual behavior in the unmedicated group. Uh, in both groups, especially those with ADHD, the use of alcohol and cannabis predicted an increase in mean levels of risky sexual behavior. So uh, overall, a very important study adds further to the earlier few studies that have already been done, all of which suggested these problems, uh, and now shows that medication might be beneficial in helping to reduce those risks. Indeed. So let's go on to our last study here, which is a study on the risk of ADHD in young children that were exposed to general anesthesia between zero and three years of age. This is published in the journal Europe PMC. Uh, it is a study out of Taiwan in which they looked at 7,536 patients between zero and three years of age who had been exposed to general anesthesia. And a no general anesthesia group was a comparison group and looked at the risk at follow-up of these children developing ADHD. And what they found is what a few earlier small studies had suggested, and that is children who might be exposed to general anesthesia during these very early years of development might have a higher risk of ADHD. In this case, it was twice the risk of the control group. Uh, and they found that the number of exposures to general anesthesia, the duration of exposure, male gender, 
uh, and whether or not the surgery was on the central nervous system were all significant risk factors for whether or not the children went on to develop ADHD. So very interesting in suggesting that th there might be a yet another non-genetic neurotoxic contributor to risk for causing ADHD. We need to be a little careful here, however, in that this is not a genetically informed study. We don't know whether or not the kids who got general anesthesia come from families with higher rates of genetic ADHD in the parents, which would increase their risk as well. We do know that children, even young children with ADHD, have much higher rates of accidental injuries of all kinds, burns, lesions, lacerations, head trauma, you name it, they get it. So ADHD children are more risk prone, therefore more likely to be hospitalized, therefore more likely to have surgery, and surgery uh, that requires general anesthesia because of the severity of their injuries. So behind the scenes here, what we simply could be seeing is that ADHD children are more likely to get general anesthesia and, of course, at follow-up, are more likely to have ADHD. So we need to have this further investigated before we can conclude definitively that it's the general anesthesia that is the uh, the, the uh, adverse effect here on risk for ADHD. Arr. Yes, indeed. <laughs> so that's our review for today, Pirates. I hope that you found this research review interesting. There's a lot more research in the thumbnail sketch. Again, I don't review dissertations or unpublished manuscripts or animal research in these reviews. I hope you'll join me again uh, next week for another research review. And if you found this one interesting, uh, please recommend this channel to others and please hit the subscribe button as well. So thanks everybody. Hope you enjoyed the little uh, comedy. I know I look like a bad version of Willie Nelson more than I look like Jack Sparrow, but hey, it was fun. So uh, take care everybody.